Today we're speaking with Wharton Professor Eitan Green about his uh, research on expert decision making and specifically umpire calls in baseball. So Eitan, nice to have you with us. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, my pleasure. So can you give us an overview of your research? Yeah, so generally what I'm interested in is decision making by experts, expertise, particularly in realms for which there are predictions available from machines, so machine-based models, algorithms, uh, or in the case of umpires in baseball, data from stereoscopic cameras behind home plate of every major league ballpark that we use to benchmark the calls that umpires make. And so this is a great setting for studying decision making by experts because we have experts who are supposed to abide by a very specific decision rule. So the pitcher throws a pitch. If the pitch is in this imaginary box, the official strike zone, defined by the width of home plate on the floor and the batter's stance, then the umpire is supposed to call a strike. Otherwise, he's supposed to call a ball. And so what we do is we use these data from the stereoscopic cameras that take a sequence of images of every pitch from its release from the pitcher's hand until it crosses the region above home plate to basically observe to what extent the umpire abides by this decision rule to make his calls based solely on the location of the pitch. And so I think the most interesting thing that comes out of the data is basically this deviation from that benchmark in a very systematic way. And so there's something in baseball called the count. The count is, keeps track of the sequence of pitches between a pitcher and a batter over the course of an at-bat. If the count reaches four balls, that's good for the batter, he walks. If it reaches three strikes, that's good for the pitcher, the batter strikes out. And so what you see is that instead of the umpire just using the location of the pitch to make his calls, pitches at the same location are sometimes called balls or sometimes called strikes, depending on the count. And in particular, the strike zone expands dramatically when the count favors the batter. And so when the count favors the batter, the umpire responds by favoring the pitcher. And vice versa, when the count favors the pitcher, the umpire responds by favoring the batter. And it, it's particularly extreme. So basically, you can think about a pitch that crosses, say, the top boundary of the official strike zone. So this pitch, in what I'll call a baseline count, the count at the beginning of the at-bat when there are zero balls and zero strikes, this pitch, an umpire calls a strike 50% of the time, and he calls a ball 50% of the time. You can think of them as being indifferent between a ball and a strike. But when the count, say, has three balls and zero strikes, when it strongly favors the batter, well, then this pitch is almost always called a strike. And the reverse is true in the opposite count with zero balls and two strikes. The same pitch at the same location is almost always called a ball. So, so why does this happen? So there are potentially a number of stories that can, can explain this result. Let me tell you about a, a particularly interesting um, and counterintuitive one. And the argument here is that what the pitcher is or what the umpire is doing is he's trading off accuracy for bias, or rather he's trading off bias for accuracy. He's being purposefully biased, consciously or unconsciously, so he's varying the strike zone that he enforces with the count. He's not making his decisions based solely on the location of the pitch, but the argument is this actually helps him make more accurate calls. And why is this the case? Well, imagine yourself as an umpire. You're squatted behind the catcher. You're looking out over his head towards the pitcher. The pitcher winds up. He throws a 90-plus mile an hour pitch. It's there in an instant. It has some lateral movement, some vertical movement. You have to decide whether this pitch is inside or outside some imaginary box. It's an incredibly difficult problem. And if you relied only on your observation of the location of the pitch, you'd probably make mistakes on a regular basis, frequently when the pitch is close. It'd be hard to say whether it was just inside the strike zone or just outside the strike zone. But fortunately for you, you have other information at your disposal. You have expectations that you've built up over many years of being a professional umpire, expectations about where the pitcher is going to throw in a certain count, and whether the batter is going to swing. And so, for instance, you might reasonably expect that when the count is three balls and zero strikes, that is when it favors the batter, that the pitcher is going to try to throw a strike. And so if the pitch is close and you're unsure whether it was just inside the strike zone or just outside the strike zone, you may err on the side of calling a strike the pitch that you expect. Now think about what happens in an 0-2 count. So in this count, you expect that the batter is going to swing at anything close. Because if he doesn't, he runs the chance of striking out. Whereas he can prolong the at-bat if he fouls the pitch off, for instance. And so imagine you see a pitch that appears close to you, but the batter chooses not to swing. How can you rationalize that decision? Well, you can rationalize it by saying that he observed something that you didn't, that his vantage point was such that he believed the pitch to be a ball. And so you might err on the side of calling a ball. And so this Bayesian updating, 
this basically rational way of processing other information that you have creates this trade-off between bias and accuracy. It helps the umpires become more accurate at the cost of having them systematically change the strikes that they enforce with this variable, the count, that has nothing to do with their directive. So what would you say a business practitioner should take away from your research? Yeah, so I think what umpires are doing is they're statistically discriminating. So they have a directive to make their calls based solely on the location of the pitch. But that's very difficult to do. It's very hard to observe the exact location every time. And so what they do instead is they say, well, I have this other information. This other information is correlated with the location of the pitch. It can help me, on average, make more accurate calls. And so, as I said before, they basically trade off bias for accuracy. And so statistical discrimination, at least opportunities for statistical discrimination, are, are just, they're, they're everywhere. And they're everywhere in the workplace, and particularly in you know, the hiring process. Uh, so for instance, you know, when we hire, we have a benchmark that sounds very similar to the umpire's directive. We want to hire the best person, the person that's going to do the best of the job, who's going to be the best fit. But it's hard in the interview process, looking at a CV or even interviewing them in person often, to decide who's the best or how good is this person? How good is this person going to be in the job? And so we may rely on other factors, factors that are either implicitly or explicitly banned that we shouldn't be using, perhaps, but factors that we believe, perhaps rightly, as in the case of the umpires, or even erroneously, to give us information about this person's fit. And so if we're right, we're going to get a little more accuracy, but it's going to come at the cost of bias. It's going to come at the cost of systematic, being able to systematically predict who we hire based on factors that have nothing to do, at least directly, with the dimension that we're trying to hire along. So what are you going to look at next? Are you going to stay, stay in baseball or look elsewhere for research? Yeah, so I mean, so baseball uh, is an opportunity to use machine-based models, these cameras, to say how good of a job umpires are doing. But I think there are a lot of interesting uh, cases in which the decisions that individuals make, that experts make, can be informed by algorithms, by machine-based predictions. And so one of the things that I'm, I'm interested in, in particular now is, is making predictions about the election. So it's particularly timely. I think a lot of us are interested in the probability that Hillary Clinton is going to win and the probability that Donald Trump will be our next president. And so one place you may go to get information about this, you may go to 538, Nate Silver's website. And one thing that Nate Silver is doing this election season that he hasn't done in previous election seasons is he's providing multiple models. So in the past, he told you the probability that Hillary Clinton would win is 77%. Now he's telling you if you believe this model, it's 72%. If you believe this model, it's 84%. And sometimes there's really quite a, a, a deviation between these two models. Well, what are these two models? Well, basically, they're making different assumptions about the world. And your decision as to which model you listen to is really a decision about what, what you believe the data generating process to be, what do you believe the world to look like. And in particular, there's one model that says we should only listen to the polls. We should only listen to what people are saying right now. And there's another model that says, actually, there are lots of predictors, e economic indicators, for instance, that, that historically have been very predictive of election outcomes. And so we should listen to those as well. And so your decision about which model to listen to or how to balance these two pieces of information basically comes down to your belief about whether this election season is totally different from the past in which case you should only listen to the polls, or if you believe that this is just another draw in some stable distribution that is similar to everything else that's come before. And so generally what I'm interested in is how can we frame questions? What types of information can we give people to make them think that this moment, the present, is just like the past, and that the past is a good predictor of the present? And what types of information, how can we frame questions to get people to think, actually, no, the process is not stationary at all. This moment is unique in time. Great. That's fascinating. Thanks very much for joining us, Eitan. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you.